So let's uh, get started. Uh, thank you everyone for um, joining the webinar four focused on industrial applications of the webinar series of data science, machine learning and AI applications and opportunity. As you all know that the growth of many businesses in healthcare manufacturing uh, and robotics uh, are centered on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And it is very clear that this sort of technologies are fundamentally reshaping the industry and society, at least in the next couple of deep decades. The data science based computational approaches uh, can identify patterns and insights that human cannot notice or decipher normally. Uh, and moreover, the data science and machine learning based approaches are faster and more scalable at doing so. So we will continue our discussions in the domain of data science, machine learning and AI applications and opportunity today with our distinguished panelists. But before I introduce our panelists today, uh, what I want to do is I want to take a minute to introduce and announce the next webinar, uh, which is going to be scheduled uh, next Thursday at 11 on. Uh, and we have three panelists, which are again coming from different domains. We have uh, Ritesh Kire, who is the vice president of uh, 841451, which is a data science company. We have Dr. Gaurav Ometa, who is a research scientist in Siemens Corporate Research in Princeton, New Jersey. And we have Dr. Ali Mehmani, who is the head of data science and analytics at Prescriptive Data Science Inc. in New York, uh, and we will listen from them, but let's move on and let's try to introduce the panelists you know, we have for today. So today's panelists, we have uh, Dr. Prakar Jaswal. Uh, Dr. Prakar Jaswal is currently a software engineer working for Google in Mountain View since 2019. And he is part of the Google Lens team that uses machine learning and computer vision to help users search for what they are seeing using their camera phones. Google Lens is a visual search engine powered by AI and Prakar's role involves developing scalable algorithms and tools to facilitate various features of Google Lens, such as object and text recognition and finding similar images and shopping, etc. Prakar received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India in 2011. And he is the recipient of the Academic Excellence Award at IIT Kanpur. Following that, he worked at National Thermal Power Corporation, NTPC Limited, as an operation engineering before uh, setting on to pursue his PhD. Parker completed his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University at Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo in 2019. And his PhD work focused on innovative use of geometric reasoning and machine learning techniques, specifically probabilistic graphical models and deep reinforcement learning to create computational tools that facilitate designers and manufacturers in executing various design and manufacturing tasks. When not working, Prakar enjoys traveling, playing tennis, watching YouTube videos and unwinding by the water. And our second panelist today is Dr. Ian Mati. And Ian Mati, Ian is a principal scientist with Intelligent Systems Lab and area manager for knowledge representation at Palo Alto Research Center Park, or formerly, formerly known as Xerox Park. And his research interest focuses on optimization, machine learning, and control. He has extensive experience in statistical and physics-based modeling in multiple physical domain, and he was PI and co-PI for several DARPA funded projects. His early research focused on distributed algorithms for optimization, estimation, and control. And prior to joining to PARC, Ion was a guest researcher at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gettysburg, Maryland, where he contributed to the development of the standards for modeling cyber physical systems. Dr. Mati received his BS and MS in electrical engineering from Politecnica University of Bucharest, Romania, and MS and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland College Park. He has co authored more than 75 journal and conference articles in leading journals and conference in control, optimization, signal processing, and robotics and AI. Uh, we also had like, the third panelist who was supposed to join, but he um, he has some uh, emergency issues that came up, so he will be not joining today, which was Dr. Sawas Suvidi. So we will only have two panelists today. And with that, 
we will get started with our first panelist which is dr prakar jaiswal on his thoughts and his uh, remarks on in general in the machine learning and ai domain prakar thank you dr rai for the kind introduction uh, let me present my screen Uh, Doctor, you need to enable. Sharing. Oh yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, uh, it is a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Uh, I am Prakash Jaiswal. I am a software engineer in the Google Lens team. and uh, today i'll be talking about some of the applications of google lens and some of the current challenges that uh, my team is trying to solve uh, so i think dr rai has already like given the background about me uh, i did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from iit kanpur and uh, my phd in mechanical engineering from the state of buffalo and now i'm currently at google working as a software engineer on the google lens team so what is google lens uh, a lot of times when i tell people that i work for google lens they confuse it with google glass which is a hardware product that google launched a few years ago so uh, that is different then a lot of people also have questions of that how is google lens different from reverse image search so reverse image search is only uh a, a, a search where you are trying to find a image which is the same or a very similar looking image but google lens goes a step further where it tries to like identify the objects within the image and gives you search results based on those objects so it is a, a visual search engine like uh, google search is for text queries like google assistant is for voice queries google lens is a search engine for image queries so some of the like google like if you want to access google lens there is an app on the play store which, which you can use and if you if you use google photos uh like you can use lens right from there like on any photo or like it's also available in the google search bar uh in the google app so uh here i have included some of the applications of google lens for example in this case you can see that uh google lens can translate the text in a foreign language into your language and overlay that text right uh, in the frame so you can it is is you can easily like read the translated text in your view this is another text related application where it basically understands or recognizes the text in the image and it allows you to uh, like read it or copy and paste uh, between different devices very seamlessly then this is another text based application where it uh, tells it it tells you how to uh, basically solve an equation uh, so this was like really helpful uh, like since the pandemic lots of schools closed so for the students it was very useful to uh, help with their like learning this is a recognition application where it recognizes recognizes plants and animals or different things then this is a shopping related application where let's say you lens a product or an object which you are interested in buying it tries to identify same product uh, or a similar product available online which you can purchase then uh, it has capability to recognize different landmarks animals and uh, also it can tell you what are some of the popular restaurants 
popular dishes at a restaurant if you are eating out uh, so in this case like it highlights uh, the popular dishes on a menu like right in your view uh, when you are linking the menu at a restaurant so how does uh, google lens work so first and the most important is lots of data as you all know like google has like tremendous amount of data it indexes all the websites on the web uh, and at the same time it's also indexes the images on those websites so it has like billions of images that it indexes and using that uh, like is is the key feature of lens then the second important part is using that data smartly so what i mean by that is that just having images uh, and indexing those wouldn't help unless you know what those images are about so uh, google, uh, google has this uh, knowledge graph which is used to represent all the knowledge that google knows uh, by passing through the websites and we use that to also annotate the images that we index so if for example if a website is talking talking about a particular topic or a particular entity we annotate the images on that website with those with that information as well and we also give weightage to information extracted from uh, things which are more closer to the image for example if the image has a caption and that caption is about an entity or a topic we annotate that image with that uh, information then a uh, third key aspect is computational resources so google has like lots and lots of computational resources to store these uh, billions of images and it also uh, allows us to like run large machine learning models for training and iterating over it to improve it uh, like uh, iteratively Uh, so the, those are uh, some of the important things that uh, allows lens to like work then uh, i will talk about some of the challenges that it faces so one of the most important challenge is latency so if you have like a really large model it might take a long time to run but if you are building a product which users which you want users to use uh, and you want to retain your users you have to provide the results very quickly so if you hit the lens button and you don't get your results uh, in a within a second you won't be able to retain your users so you cannot deploy like a very large model which takes let's say 15 seconds to run uh, for real world applications so uh so you need to make sure that your models are small enough and the latency is small enough that you can uh, like give the results in like orders of hundreds of milliseconds then uh the other aspect is that we are trying to get more and more features on device what it means is that like your images won't leave your device and the computations will happen on device itself using the resources on the device so that is uh, another uh, important thing where which uh, basically restricts us in using like large uh, amount of memory uh, which is available so we need to make our model small so that it can be deployed on the device at the same time you have to ensure that it can uh it the quality is good enough even with that small model so it it serves two purposes one is privacy concerns so if you don't want the images to leave your device uh you can be assured that your your the image bytes are not leaving your device so that protects your privacy the second is uh in if you have uh the internet connectivity is is uh poor let's say if you are in a remote location or you are in uh, some countries where 
uh, internet connectivity is poor, then you don't need to send the whole image to the lens server to get a result. The computation happens on the device itself. And then you just send, uh, let's, for example, a feature vector, which is abstracted from the image to the server to get the results. Then uh, another aspect uh, or another challenge that we face is quality. Uh, so quality is like, it's, it's not sufficient to just find the most visually similar image on the web and give you that result. So I will give you an example here. For example, if you are, if you are, for example, then if you find a friend with a shoe, which you really like, and that shoe is a used, used shoe, and you lens that shoe to purchase that shoe for, for yourself as well. So in that case, let's say you have two results. One is on eBay, which is a used shoe that someone is selling. And another is uh, like a brand new shoe, which is sold on, let's say, Nike.com. So most likely, the based on visual similarity, the, shoe, the image that you're lensing of the shoe would be more similar to the used shoe that is being sold on eBay. But is that more appropriate result for the user to show the eBay result? So in that case, like in addition to visual similarity, you have to consider other factors as well when you are presenting the results to the user. So this is just one example. There are a lot of similar uh, factors that we need to consider when uh, giving results to the users. Uh, then. Uh, another aspect is personalization. So you want to give results to the users that are more appropriate for that uh, user or the, that demographic. So here, let's say you are lensing a shoe in the US versus you're lensing the shoe, let's say in India. The, the merchants that sell that shoe in India might be very different from the merchants that sell the shoe in, in the US. And we don't want to give uh, results of a US website in India because you, those websites won't be able to ship that product in India or it will be too expensive for the, uh, for, for the users to buy. So you have to consider what demographics your user come from. And this is not just country's perspective. You can also think of it as, uh, let's say, younger population might want a different set of results, whereas older population might want a different set of results. So you have to uh, also think about who is uh, lensing or the user profile when you are giving results. Then uh, lastly, one of the uh, feature that we are working towards and it's way down the line like it's too far into the future is multimodality which is uh, basically combining different modalities of searches into one so like google searches for text queries google assistant is for voice queries and google lenses for image queries can you like combine these modalities together to give a more a powerful user experience to the users. So in, in this case, for example, let's say you have a shoe and, uh, sorry, I'm taking example of shoe again and again, but uh, you, let's say you, are, you have a shoe, but you're not sure whether that shoe would be good to hike uh, on a mountain, let's say. So you can, uh, the vision is that users can lens the, or take an image of the shoe and then ask Google that whether this shoe would be good for hiking this particular mountain on a rainy day. And Google will try to understand your text queries or your voice queries along with the image that you provided and give you results based on that uh, information. Uh, that's all I have. I will uh, pass it on to Ion. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Prakar, uh, for presenting um, such a nice full applications of the Google Lens. And we will move on to Dr. Matei.
Okay, good morning, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Uh, I think you need to make me, okay, who can share? Jan, you have okay. the co-host. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I saw it, thank you. Okay. You should be seeing my screen now. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Rahul for, for inviting me to share part of our work that we're doing uh, in applications of artificial intelligence. Um, my name is Jon Matei. I am a principal scientist and area manager with the Intelligence System Lab at the Palo Alto Research Center. And um, what I'm going to do today, I will share with you uh, some examples of applications that we work on and how AI technologies help us uh, solve some of the challenges uh, within this application. And uh, before going to that, I will just tell you a bit about Park. I'll not spend a lot of time here. So. Park has a long uh, history of innovation, right? It's a wholly subsidiary of, of Xerox and operates under what is called an open innovation model. And what this means is that it, um, it mixes strategy to develop new capabilities and to create partnerships for technology and market access. Now, Park is, in, has, is evolved in uh, different research directions, right? AI, long history in, in AI, and what we're trying to do is create a system that can uh, better collaborate with humans. Lots of work on digital workspace where we integrate physical and digital works to improve how the flow of work, uh, to improve the flow of work through conversational intelligence assistance, for instance. Novel printing, right? We create, for instance, smart packaging technologies. Uh, examples would be like small sensor that you attach on, on uh, packages to measure temperatures. IoT, lots of IoT applications uh, created for creating smart sensors, um, for instance, to, to uh, enable rapid and reliable collection of, of data. Digital design, Rahul is a bit familiar with that, where we develop algorithms to design and analyze and plan. Uh, the manufacture the manufacture of different parts uh, and some work in microsystem and in part I will give an example on that. Um, so the type of work that myself and my co-workers co 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 are involved right revolve around the intersection between machine learning optimization diagnosis and control and physics-based modeling. And I gave here a few examples of projects. I will talk a bit in more details about them later on, on at least some of them. But the main idea that we, we look at AI technology as, as enabling us to solve challenges within uh, different applications. And uh, there are some obvious enablers here that really help us models or representations, algorithms and platforms. And in particular, uh, we made use of uh, features such as automatic differentiation to address challenges that I will describe in, in a few uh, slides further on. But the key idea for us, uh, AI is an enabler. AI technology represents, it enable us to solve challenges. So I would like to give you a first example, uh, which may be immediate, where we demonstrated that uh, AI models can actually uh, be of help to improve the, the state of the art. So what, what is the problem, right? The problem is, and the, the question, the main question here that we're trying to ask, can machine learning help improve the state of the art in HF communication? So HF, it's high frequency communication, right? So this domain is particular is of particular interest to, to organizations such as DOD because if satellites communication are disrupted, that is a backup plan. However, HF communication is not very robust, is very sensitive to, to disturbances that can be uh, man-made. Uh, it uh, is not stationary. So many uh, propagations layers uh, that make communication a little bit more, more challenging. And the typical architecture in, in an HF communication pipeline is basically at the 
transceiver, you have an encoder that generates that encodes symbols, and then you have a modulator. And then the resulting signal is sent uh, through, through the channel. In this particular case, in HF communication is a ionospheric channel. And then at the receiver side, you have again a pipeline uh, that typically um, contains an adaptive equalizer, modulation, denoises, and again, decoding. So can we do better? That's the main question. And the answer is yes. So just by replacing, for instance, uh, the pipeline at the receiver with a what we call a direct symbol decoder that is based on machine learning model, in this particular case, in our end, actually we can, we can improve a lot the state of the art. And I, I gave here one uh, e example, uh, for instance, for the same performance metric. And here by performance metric, we mean the beta rates of the transmission error, basically. Uh, for the same performance metric, uh, we can actually uh, tolerate much, much lower signal to noise ratio, in this particular case, six uh, uh, decimal. And uh, we, we are working on extending this type of uh, models to more adapt to adaptive models that, that tolerate much more significant uh, changes in. Uh, uh in the quality of the channel so main idea right we can improve the state of the art by using machine learning models that actually are combined with with existing pipeline in um, in hf communication another example of application which i actually find it interesting from from my perspective is um control the control application so what is the problem yeah, right. So Park has been working on, on uh, what is called a microassembler printer, where the objective is to, to get micro objects or chiplets, to arrange them in patterns, and then to transfer them to, to a permanent uh, set, setup. So you can imagine, can I build microelectronic circuits? How would I do that? Right, a part, an important problem of that is, is how am I actually do the assembly? So how am I going to arrange these small objects into pattern that I care and so that can later on I can transfer them. Well, control engineering comes uh, uh, here, it will play a pro prominent role. And for instance, in this particular case, uh, model kind of approach can be a use. However, we have a bunch of challenges. Now the challenges come to the complexity of uh, the physics and the model that we are using, right? So you, we can work with thousands and thousands of chiplets and the models can become very, very complicated. Now, more importantly, right? When we do control, we need some physical quantities that, that, that to express them. And such quantities, for instance, are forces that are expressed in terms of potential energies. How can we get those derivatives of, of uh, potential uh, energies, right? It is not trivial. So of course, one can think, let's do it by hand. Analytically, it's too hard. When you have thousands of, of, of uh, chiplets, it's actually very challenging to do that. But another option is to, to uh, apply symbolic uh, uh, computation. Again, does not scale. So we solve this challenge by using uh, the automatic differentiation features in, in machine learning, in modern machine learning platform. They do scale. In this particular case, uh, we we had uh, for instance, we use Jax. Actually, Jax now is, de is developed by by a group at, at Google uh, and maintained by, by a group at uh, Google, right? So, using this feature, right, we are able to to produce accurate physical models. Then we can use them in combination with with control approach. So what's the, the benefit of this? We do not have to, to use numerical approximation or symbolic calculations, right? That do not scale. And hence, as a consequence, uh, we have more accurate uh, models that actually scale with a number of var variables. So conclusion uh, of this application here, we, we used uh, AI technology, in particular, modern AI technology, and in particular, automatic differentiation Right, as an enabler for control applications. Now, another example, and probably many of you are familiar with this kind of, of uh, examples here, is 
using machine learning models as surrogate models for physical system. And why do we, that makes sense? I will give you uh, the rationale in the context of a diagnostics application. So we are currently working on, um, um, uh, on a project of a, that concerns uh, autonomous ships, right? And uh, what we care in part is op operational autonomy, right? So, and part of this is uh, if there is a problem with, with your system, right? You would like to automatically detect that and then uh, predict what will happen in the future uh, with this, uh, with your system, and then perhaps take measures such as automatic repairs if it's possible. Now, in, in this uh, slide, I'm showing um, a, an example of fault diagnosis for diesel generator that provides power. So now there are different faults that can happen. And based on the circumstances of how the, the, the system is operated, we can detect faults with higher or lower accuracy. For instance, in the case of lower loads for my diesel generator, it's much more difficult to, to uh, detect fault and or better said to distinguish between different possible faults. So what can we do about it? Well, what can we do about it is try to make small changes in, in how the, the, my physical system behaves so that we can emphasize and differentiate better between these faults. Uh, and you can think of this as biasing a little bit uh, the system behavior so that if a certain fault is valid, it's going to be very different from, from uh, uh, other faults. So we can formulate this as some constraint optimization problem that you can try to solve. However, we have one challenge here. And the challenge is we want to be able to detect and distinguish between different faults as fast as possible. Uh, now, these models here, right, and these systems are, are rather complex. And we can represent them in many ways, physics-based model. But uh, if we're trying to use, with them, use them in optimization, right, it's very difficult to, to use gradient-based algorithms because we can actually not, we cannot directly uh, compute this gradient. And hence, we have to resort either, again, to numerical approximations or to use gradient-free algorithms, right? So, we pay a price for that. And the price for that is the fact that the algorithms will be slower and has will affect real-time execution and, uh, and operation of the ship. So what can we do? Well, machine learning models come to the rescue. We can actually invest um, in offline. Uh, we invest some time offline to, to train. We can think of it, no, I would not call them digital twins, but surrogate models uh, that, that, reflect, that reflect the behavior of the physics-based model, and then we'll use that in, in, uh, in the optimization procedure that will tell us how should we change the behavior of the system to emphasize better uh, different faults. And this approach is actually, in, in, in the test that we've done, showed us that for the same level of performance, we can get a 30 times uh, efficiency in, 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 uh, in the optimization time. In other words, we can get a solution 30 times faster by employing uh, this model. And the reason is now that once we have these representations uh, of physics-based model, we can integrate them with, uh, for instance, machine learning platform, deep learning platform, Python or JAX or whatever you like. And this model has the advantage that have the right constructs that enable us to use automatic differentiation. And as a result, we can execute optimization much, much faster than what we could do uh, using, for instance, gradient-free algorithms or using um, uh, approximations of, of gradient. Um, now, one other example that I would like to show here, and it's uh, very interesting uh, for, for me because it represents a combination of what some people may call modern and classic AI uh, algorithms. So let, what, what is the context here, right? So the, cost of, the context is the following. Assume that someone gives you some binary code uh, actually, there is a type we should be binary code 
uh, of some controller, feedback controller, right? And that someone tells you, you know, can you tell me actually what's going on inside? And can you give me, can you reconstruct a representation that someone, that a control engineer can interpret? And we have, we propose a, a pipeline here to actually do that. And this pipeline contains a decompiler and the, we're using here modern new compiler, which is neural decompiler. decompiler. There are several uh, out there. I think one of the most newer, uh, newer one is one produced by, by, um, uh, produced by Facebook. And this neural decompiler can take uh, binary code and generate source code. But the most important feature of this is that the source code is highly interpretable as, interpretable as compared to, to the standard dec decompiler. Now, next, the, this uh, source code, the, the source code, right, it's further processed to reproduce, to regenerate a, a model uh, of the controller that can be interpreted by, uh, by a subject matter. Aspect. And this is done basically by looking at uh, different uh, AST, what is called uh, AST abstract syntax tree. Uh, that are combined in a very particular way to generate uh, the end result. And the classic part of AI here is that we use uh, symbolic regression that is enabled by genetic algorithms to make this combination of different uh, abstract syntax, syntax tree until we reach, um, we are able to, to reconstruct the, the original model. And this is just an example here of uh, how this may work, right? As you do the symbol, once you get uh, the, the code, right, you start playing with this abstract syntax tree, combine them in a particular way. And as you keep uh, running the genetic algorithm, right, you, keep you have different generations, you start reconstructing um, this model uh, from, from the binary file until you get something that actually makes sense. So it makes sense, must be in the sense that it must be a feasible model from the point of view of, uh, let's say, a, a control en engineer, and also from the point of view of a, a model. Does it have the right number of equations? Does it respect the syntax? And so on and so forth. So conclusion of this application, right? We have combined modern and classic AI technology to enable us to reconstruct models of feedback controllers from binary code. So these are a few examples of, uh, of application. And now I would like to, to spend a, a few uh, minutes here on, um, on some perspective of AI from the point of view of design. So, um, you know, my group and actually the, uh, part of the group that I, that I work with, right, we care these days uh, about design. And one of the questions that we're asking is, okay, how can AI help us with design of cyber physical systems? Now, this problem is by far not trivial, right? And why is that? We have recent technological uh, advances through which we're able to, to discover new material, say composite material, we generate uh, new technology for, for manufacturing processes. You know, we have additive or hybrid additive with uh, uh, subtractive manufacturing. And of course, while this is uh, very great because it allows us more flexibility in, in building uh, parts and systems, right? This comes at a cost. And the cost is that now we're dealing with a much more complicated uh, search space for, for designs. And just as an example, even if we're talking about discrete type of choices, let's say a material, right? We're, we're talking about the combinatorial explosion. And uh, so it's good that we have new uh, materials and technology, but this actually can make our life much more difficult when we're talking about design. So, there, there are other challenges here, right? Uh, cyber physical systems are by definition hybrid because they typically include both hardware aspects and then more software aspects. However, there are a, an additional source of uh, hybridizations if you want. Now we can integrate also machine learning models that are driven by, by data. 
And why is that relevant? Well, now the fact that we have uh, more data, right, enable us to represent physics that may have been too complicated to represent before, but now our search and the models that we're working with are even more complicated. So what can, uh, what can we do? So the fundamental question, right, is how can we execute search in, in, in this much more complicated in environment? And we are investigated how AI technologies, right, can help with that. So what are possible ideas that what could use, right? So one is about how can we uh, compactly and efficiently represent uh, the search space? For instance, you can think about dividing uh, the search space into feasible and unfeasible design. And one possible representation, it will be fancy and complicated classifier with at some point, rather than sampling, randomly sampling, we can guide the search in regions that, that are feasible. So again, machine learning models can, can help with, with that. Uh, another possible option is to reduce a little bit uh, the complexity is to embed uh, physical constraints into the different machine, le machine learning models that, that uh, we are using. And the effect of this, again, we are constraining the search space. Rahul is familiar with this kind of uh, applications. And uh, another way that especially people at Google, right, are, are using is dedicated hardware technologies. So Google is uh, pioneering TPUs for which they get tremendous uh, speed, speed up. But this also is combined with, with large scale optimi optimization approaches, right? You have different uh, uh, learning platforms, TensorFlow, uh, JAX. And one of my uh, favorite these days is, you know, how can we actually use uh, AI algorithms to solve this large scale um, mixed integer constraint program? These are typically very hard to deal, and, uh, with, to deal with and uh, uh, they typically, the current approaches, standard approaches, they, they do not scale. However, there is some hope in using um, methods based on, on reformed learning to solve this complicated mixed uh, combinatorial or mixed integer program, uh, programs. And so these are a few ideas uh, uh, that we're trying to pursue and how, and this is how we, we hope that AI technology could help us uh, some of the challenges that we are currently uh, addressing in, in design. And with that, I will pass the baton back to uh, Rahul and thank you for, for following this, this talk. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Prakar, for uh, outlining and presenting your remarks and various applications uh, of um, machine learning and AI in different domains like design, uh, image search, and so on. So with that, let's um, open the platform for question. We have one question uh, from the audience, and this is um, to Prakar, um, which is like, what are the contrasting aspects of personalization and privacy, right? You mentioned about those issues uh, during the Google image search. And the question is like, uh, what are those aspects and how do you handle them? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question. So uh, like when so there can be like multiple ways, one of the easiest uh, way or the most obvious way would be to ask the users, what information are they comfortable sharing? So that also provides users with the trust uh, that is very important for Google. So you give users the control of uh, their information. So that is like one of the most obvious thing. Then second is like, instead of personalizing at an individual, individual level, you can also do personalization based on demographics. So rather than using that person's uh, uh, data to train your model, you can use sort of like a uh, data of the demographics, like in this age group or in this region, uh, you will give this kind of results. Then third uh, thing is you can use uh, federated learning. So federated learning is a, uh, is a, way to train your train your machine learning models using data that are 
decentralized so these these this data is not collected and uh, collected from the users and like the models are not trained at one server but there are like the data remains on the device itself so it's like local data and you train your algorithms based on that local data without the data leaving that device itself so you can use those sort of uh, algorithms to train your model to uh, basically give personalized results to the users thank you prakar for answering uh, the next question is for uh, dr mate uh, and this is like as you are using the ai for developing the chiplet based process how do you handle if the prediction is not expected is not as expected and if it is a if it is a physics based model or uh, you might look for marginal physical phenomena and how do you handle this in case of ai algorithms okay so here uh, right we use part of the ai technology to actually to, to get a accurate physical model and i will address the lack of prediction or the problem with inaccurate models the following way this is a control problem right typically when we design control algorithms they tend to to be to some extent robust to to uh, errors in in the model and even even though those model they are not be as accurate as possible right we can tolerate that so indeed those model are not perfect there is physics there that uh, we do not capture and in in real time control algorithms right there is always a trade off complexity of the model versus how fast i can do the computation so yes I, we may have a chance uh, using all this hybrid modeling to to generate accurate models but the more complex they are the more difficult is to use them in in uh, in a real time setup so there is this trade off So my answer, the short answer is uh, typically control algorithms are able to to deal with errors in in the model. That's one of their uh, purpose there. And uh, modeling, right? If you're talking about other applications than control, then yes, we 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 do care about having accurate models. For instance, design purposes, we do care about highly accurate predictions. There, sure, we can talk about work, putting a little bit more work in producing accurate models. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Uh, the next question is for Prakar again, and this is a question on edge computing. Uh, so, can you elaborate challenges uh, on the challenges for model inferences on edge devices for CV applications, and how do you ensure that the model are device and hardware agnostics? Prakar, you're Prakar. muted. sorry uh so i am not like uh, an expert in penetrated learning but i think uh like when you depending on like what kind of data you are gathering uh, from different devices you can like it depends on your application also like if if for example you are training uh, a model to Uh, like do object and identification uh, so in that case like maybe the most likely the hardware wouldn't matter because you have uh, like a image that uh, that you are taking from the at the local server and sort of what kind of results did the user click on so so here uh, based on it's sort of like a learning approach iteratively like you give users some search results and based on their click through rate you improve your model and that uh, that could be used in federated learning in in the sense that you don't want to use that information like you don't want to collect that information in a lo- in a centralized server but you keep that uh, information on the device and you just improve your model based on that uh, information that is on the device does that answer your question sure thank you thank you prakar uh, for answering that uh, there is one more um, question for dr mutey and this is related to 
basically combination of materials and design. And the question is um, that, do you see an overlap in design space when it comes to the selection of materials? And if yes, what kind of models you use to identify materials from that pool that best serves the defined application? This is, uh, yeah, so uh, we have a bunch of projects on this. It is, uh, it is not my, I'm not an expert in this, but I'll tell, I'll give you my, my take. So there are several challenges here, right? So challenge number one, okay, is how you select material. So, um, you know, Rahul probably knows this better than me. Typically you have a bunch of metrics uh, such as, uh, I forgot, typically you have, if you try to design a part, right? You are a metric such as compliance. And you would try to solve a topology optimization where in addition to the shape that you like to, to, to choose, you also like to choose the type of material that satisfies this kind of metric such as compliance. This is challenge number one. Challenge number two, which is unsolved to, to my knowledge, is even if I say that, you know, I will uh, part of my part is going to be of material one and part of my part is going to be material two, how am I going to combine them? And what's we, we, from the manufacturing uh, process, right? So I can think, okay, let's say that I use additive manufacturing, that may be a little bit easier. How do I um, explain what will happen and the intersection between two, two material? What are the physical law there? Can I say something interesting? So I, I, would, I wish I would have a better answer, that, at least from my perspective is people actually, we do not know what exactly happens. So what we do, we try to build them and then test them. And then as we learn more, we try to find representations and model that will guide us to, to further test the different things. So from the theoretical point of view, we can design parts that combine uh, different material. From the practical point of, point of view, we still need to actually validate that the part that we're building satisfy certain metric that we care about. So for instance, if we put different material together, we do not them to be brittle at the connection point because that defeats all the purpose. Thank you, thank you. And that was very, very uh, great answer. Um, so with that, I will move uh, to some general question that our audience always have. Uh, and this is more um, with respect to the students and the people who are trying to upskill uh, and come into the data science and machine learning field. And one of the questions I have for both the panelists, uh, yeah, and in, you can answer them in any sequence you want, uh, because there are many students in the audience who are considering their own career path in this domain, data science and machine learning domain. So can you tell us a little bit more about your own journey, your own journey and how you arrived at the current job you have? <laughs> Prakar, why don't you start? Sure. You're younger. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I guess like I was always interested in computer science domain, but I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And then after that, I wanted to like also uh, learn more about computer science. So I tried to like, I then uh, decided to pursue my PhD in, in a uh, like interdisciplinary domain. So I wanted to do research which involves both mechanical engineering and computer science. And then uh, most of my research projects during my PhD involved solving problems in design and manufacturing using machine learning and AI. And that is when like I started to learn uh, more about uh, this field and I started to get comfortable. And uh, then eventually I, I had, like I learned those skills and I ended up with Google Lens. Thank you, Prakir. Okay, let me try and answer, you know, unlike Prakar, when I did my PhD, machine learning was not as hot. So, uh, you know, I did my PhD in application of, of, uh, of optimization, sort of more, more applied math -y like. However, as, you know, as we move through our career, right, we, are, we tr at least from my perspective, it's very important to try to uh, adapt to uh, what's new and what's useful in the work that we are doing. One of the... Uh, 
gravest mistake that I see even in some of my colleagues is their inflexibility to adapt to new technologies, algorithms, discoveries. Uh, you know, nature has uh, one tenant, adapt or perish, right? I think mm -hmm. in part is, is true in, in research as well as in academia. We have to always be up to date with the new technologies, uh, new science that is uh, out there. So for, for me, I had one bit of advantage here in terms of you know, connection with machine learning, right? Uh, many of the machine learning algorithms, model representation are based on optimization. I was reasonably familiar with, uh, with the theory of optimization. So the, the, the passing was, the tr well, transition was not that complicated. What I had to learn, obviously, are uh, the new technologies that enable uh, this application, right? Let's keep up to date with TensorFlow, PyTorch, or whatever that you like, different kind of models that people try um, in industry. Familiarize yourself with technology that uh, enable you to access large data set, how you integrate them, how you scale them up, and so on and so forth. So my suggestion, my advice to you, you know, keep learning. Uh, what, what's new there, you know, be curious about new technologies that appear, new science, because world evolves whether we like it or not. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I have one more general question, um, which is uh, typically a favorite question of the audience is like, um, what according to you is uh, or are the attributes of a good data scientist and machine learning person? So what do you think are the skill sets or attributes of a good data science and machine learning person? I'm going to give an answer because I thought actually about this in a different... Uh... So uh, one, don't neglect your software engineering skill, right? In any, in the Bay Area, at least if you want to get a job, that's, uh, that will be required. Uh, however, however, and I emphasize this, right? Do not neglect your engineering background as well, because that is what uh, will enable you to be the differentiator. So there were a lot of people that will know how to go code, but the fact that you understand the, the particularity of a physical problem, the problem, an engineering problem that uh, you are going to work is going to give you the edge on that compared to other people. Thank you, Jan. Broker, your yeah. comments on this? Yeah, so I agree with what Jan said completely. And I would add that you should also have the like clarity of the concept. So if you're in data science and machine learning domain, like you'd see like there are a lot of already existing libraries which allows you to train any machine learning model. But you have to have uh, like clarity of what that machine learning model is doing. So there are so many different algorithms. You need to understand the limitations and advantages of, uh, of them and have some insights into the data that you're using it for. So, uh, so you should, you should know like the you should understand the problem that you are trying to solve and uh, have some insights into the data and use it smartly to train your algorithm so rather than just like getting down and coding uh, uh, the algorithms the person who has some insights and clarity into which algorithms to use has an advantage uh, then as as eon said that you you should also not forget your engineering background and you should use that to your advantage to understand and uh, like formulate your problem into a into a machine learning or mathematical uh, problem that you can solve. Thank you, Prakar. Uh, with that, we come to the conclusion of this webinar and I would like to thank both the panelists, Dr. Prakar Jaspal and Dr. Ian Mukti for taking their valuable time and spending this time with the community and helping us with this community building effort. And with that, we will conclude. And again, I want to say that we will continue this webinar series and we have an exciting set of presentations also scheduled in the next week. Bye. Everyone. Thank you, Rahul. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.